Okay, so I mentioned yesterday that we're uh, not, I gave you the source sheet, but we're, I don't think we're going to read it inside. I think we're going to spend all the time, like, just summarizing it. Yeah. 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 You want to ask it? Ask it now, just in case, uh, in case we don't get around to it. That way I could, like, think of it. All right. So, in, in um, Mrs. Bader's class, actually, you, you can talk about it. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, in this one, one side. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, no, 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 we're doing, uh, we're doing Nach. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but so uh, we're going to just do a summary of the build up, it was response to build up. We're not going to read it inside. Or I don't think we're going to have time to read it inside, and I want to move on next week. Yeah, so quick summary. Hold on, let me just. Yes, okay. now you want to ask? Yeah. <laughs> so we were learning, and we talked about this second about Mashiach, and then how, like, and then I was like, thinking, like, well, like, we're talking about like, a time where, like, we had not, because, like, Everything will be like more physical in the beginning. But not just that. Everything will be Cause like, Because, like, even like after, yeah, like everything, everything will be because, like, we'll have, because we'll, like, know, like, from Mashiach, like, stuff like that. But, like, after Matan Torah and stuff, like, we already had knowledge of Hashem, like, other generations later, like, obviously get messed up along the way. It's like, how will Mashiach be, like, sure, like, not temporary thing? Um, how will, you mean, what, what's going to prevent it from going back to the way yeah. it was? That's a good question. So I'll give you the short answer now, and then maybe sometime when we talk about Mashiach as a topic, we could give a longer answer. The Ramam says that, um, that once you have something that is very, very good, and that's well established, then it by nature will last, uh, it, it, it will be built to last. And so like, like, if you imagine, like, you know, if you imagined, hmm, how, how should I put it? What usually causes good things not to last? Huh. Yeah, us, right? Okay. Yeah, meaning like specifically like we make a mistake, a mistake right, we making a mistake. Yeah, using our, right? our free will decisions in a bad way. So if you imagine the, a good society where so much knowledge is available for everyone, and where all the the Torah is being kept, and where people in general like it's not like we won't have a Yitzhahara, but everything will be functioning smoothly and we will see the benefits of the Torah lifestyle, there's just going to not be so much of an incentive to mess it up. And if anyone starts to go out of line, then like there will be lots and lots of good people to assist them. So it's kind of like a, you, you get like a, there's like a, you know, like there's a tipping point for bad stuff. Like if it gets bad, then it, it then if it gets to the tipping point, then just, it crashes down. There's also a tipping point for good in a sense where you get to a certain critical level where everyone is on board and everyone sees the benefits of everything. And like, if anyone starts to go out of line, they have lots and lots of good people to help them with all of the knowledge and all the mitzvahs and all of the like psychological midos perfection. But then with that, there are gonna be generations who are born during Mashiach and they don't see the other side. They just see the good. They don't see like how good it is. They back their normal. Right, and I be, that might be to their advantage in the sense that like that they will uh, they'll be they'll they won't feel the need to deviate from the good because it's going so well for them. In other words, you don't need to see the bad in order to, to be attached to the good. It certainly does help, but- You also don't need to see the bad to do that. Uh, right, and that's why I'm saying though that, that the fact that if, if anyone is, is like veering off of the path, then there are gonna be lots and lots of like safeties in, in place right. to like, like help them to get- But in that case, a lot of bad things that happen can just happen in your head. Psychological but in order for it to affect society and to undo the Mashiach stuff, then it's going to have to express itself in action. And chances are, it's not going to express itself. It's not like well, everyone will be fine, and then one day Leia's going to decide to drop an atomic bomb on the you know, like like it, there's like there's like a process of like going bad or like going off the track. And there'll be lots and lots of people there to. Uh, well, I'll give you a bad muscle, okay? Bad muscle, right? Let's say for instance, um, everyone was a. A, an excellent psychologist okay let's say everyone in a, in a village was an excellent psychologist okay so chances are now that doesn't make you immune to having psychological problems but if someone started to have psychological problems number one people would notice it number two people would know what the problem is and number three people would be able to help so imagine if everyone's a psychologist and let's say everyone also is a uh is has knowledge of like the physical body, like a doctor, right? I'm not saying it's gonna be like that in Mashiach, I'm just giving an example, you know? And everyone has knowledge of ethics and everyone 
has knowledge of practical decision making. So any anyone who who is struggling or starts to have help or starts to need help will immediately get the help and that'll bring them back and everyone will keep each other af afloat. Good. <laughs> yeah. It's like even if they're doing a secretly bad thing, it translates to something public that will make someone. Yeah, it's gonna have to manifest itself publicly in some way. Like people can't can't keep it secret for so long. Um, so that has to do with something we're gonna get to later on in EOV, which is the relationship between knowledge and uh, bad decisions. I mean, that's kind of what we did in Mishlay also, but like he was gonna take it into a different level and he does address, uh, so the plan is like this, just to, it's not gonna mean much to you, but I'll just say it in numbers. So we're doing, um, finishing the uh, EOV and his friends. Then we're gonna go back to the Satan Mashal, define Malachim, define Satan, and then do the Ramam's more Nebuchim, chapter 8, 10, 11, and 12. And in 11 is where he talks about Mashiach. So it, it's like, it's coming. To, it's coming. I don't want to, I don't want to like uh, talk about it now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that then. We know that. Okay. Eov, speaking of Eov. So Bill Dodd's basic argument to Eov. Why are you suffering Eov? Because? They're just that special. <laughs> You're just that special, <laughs> yeah, right? You, you. So what? No, so specifically, what? what uh, so I interrupted you. What, what, you what, what does he? What does he mean? Oh, because um, Hashem's like this is like not less, but he's making your reward more. Yeah, he's increasing your reward. Okay, good. And that was the um, the triple Venn diagram. Is that uh, uh, Eliphaz holds that Hashem brought afflictions on Eov to punish him. Bildad holds that Hashem brought afflictions not to punish him, but to increase his reward. And unlike Elifaz, Bilda is willing to accept the fact that Eov is a tzaddik. Okay, fine, you're a tzaddik, I'll believe you. You know, your kids, they, they got killed uh, for their sins, but, uh, but you're a tzaddik, and, uh, and so it can't be a punishment, and therefore it must be to increase your reward. And what was Bildad's source for this belief? Masora. Okay, good. And I'm gonna, I said this uh, by Elifaz, and I want to say it for every, every, uh, for every point. These are false answers in EO, but there is truth to them. For example, we do hold that Hashem punishes for sins. We do hold that there is a, a, a concept of like, of suffering that can lead to reward. Okay. But the question is, is this an adequate answer for EO? And the answer is going to be no. So the book is saying, this is, this does not, they do not succeed in convincing EO of this. And just like we saw, Elifaz had some like mistakes that he was operating based on. We're going to see today that Bildad has some mistakes that he's operating on. Okay. All right. So, as we mentioned yesterday, Eo's main approach to Bildad is, "What do you mean?" And uh, and he's basically saying, "If you're correct, then then you you should be able to explain how what you're saying makes sense." And Eo is going to shoot down each one of these ways. Okay. And uh, so he divides them into in intrinsic and extrinsic. And remember, what does intri intrinsic mean? It within, itself. within itself, right? So somehow when Bildad says your suffering leads to reward, it happens intrinsically. And then the other one is extrinsic, which means from outside. Okay, so, so, so he's going to say there are five things you could mean about how suffering leads to reward, okay? First one is natural, okay? Bildad, do, and you got you to think of this as Eof talking to Bildad. Bildad, do you mean that somehow it, when I suffer, that suffering will naturally like result in a, a future reward. For example, childbirth is an example of this, okay? So childbirth is a painful thing, but uh, forget C-sections for one second and forget anesthesiology or uh, okay. epidurals. Yeah, 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 right, right. But let's say like the process of, of a body giving birth, the only way that the baby can get out is through pain, right, to the mother, right? So it's like, it has to be this way. So is that what you're saying? Okay, that's one possibility. Okay, that in order for me to get this reward, the only way to get it is uh, is, is through a painful process. Or here's another example, is uh, when you uh, baby is teething, right? Teeth pushing up through the gums is an inherently painful thing, but it's the only way like for you, for the teeth to, emer to emerge. You can't just like plop them on from the outside, okay? So that's one possibility, okay? And remember, he was outlining this and then he's gonna refute all of them, okay? Second way, and this is gonna this is gonna need some explanation here, okay? Is um, an artificial intrinsic system, okay? So think of it as compensation, and what this would mean is um, is that Eos is being given a certain amount of suffering, and then he's gonna get a reward in exchange for that suffering, 
okay? And the example would be like monetary exchange, okay? Or carnival tickets, okay? So let's use carnival tickets as an example, okay? So the, what's the system, you know, I mean, carnival money tickets. To get, like, play the game, yep. And then you get tickets, Right, so the, you, the way it works with the tickets is like you you given five tickets and you get like the, the, the plastic ring and you given 50 tickets, you get the teddy bear, okay, right? So it's like, the only way there's no way to get those carnival prize you can't just go like like buy or take the carnival prizes you have to exchange the tickets for the prize so so too maybe eos is getting a certain amount of like pain tickets okay so to speak and like those pain tickets are redeemed in olam haba or whatever or in olam haza for uh for reward okay all right and but again if you think to yourself that these things are irrational uh, hold off on it because that's what Eo was going to say. Okay, and we'll we'll try to like we'll we'll, we'll go through it and I'll give you a chance to like uh, predict what Eo is going to say for each one of these. So why are they um, well, well, that's what we're going to explore. Okay, all right. Now, extrinsic extrinsic methods would be like this. One is tefillah. So I all mentioned this yesterday. Maybe Eo is suffering so that he will pray to Hashem, and Hashem will reward him. Okay, but he's trying to get Hashem to to, to daven. Or so Hashem is trying to get Eo to daven. Okay. Um, where do we see this, by the way, in um, Torah? Yeah. Um, I don't think Avram, but you're around the right area. I don't think Yishmael, but you're around the right area. Yeah. W what's the case? Yeah, right. It's with all the Imahos, right? Especially with Rivka, right? Then uh, they say that um, that... Um, what's the phrase in Hebrew? Hashem desires the tefillahs of tzaddikim, right? And so, oh, all yeah, I just noticed they were Sarah, Rachel. Oh, okay. Leah doesn't count. Leah, Leah also had uh, barrenness issues, really? yeah. Didn't know that, yeah. Hashem closed her womb. Miriam, no, Miriam's not, no, Did I talk about no, to go through the imahos. Wait, who are the Sarah, <laughs> no, Sarah, Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, and Leah. Yeah, oh they all gosh. have. Yeah, this is Mrs. Fishbein's book that she published, uh, Infertility in the Bible, where she, she goes. Book yeah, a while ago. Yeah, yeah, oh. available on Amazon. <laughs> um, yeah, it's good. It's a good book. It's the best book on tefillah in English that I've read, uh, and it goes through each of the imahos and uh, not just imahos. She also goes through Hana and you know, um, but uh, like what their infertility, like wh how their infertility led them to work on themselves through tefillah and chuva and all this other stuff. And then to, you know, to benefit from there. Cause I, you know, and, and Ms. Fishman obviously is giving her own personal experience with this also. So yeah, yeah, it's a good book, but yeah. So that has all say that God desires the, the tefillahs with tzaddikim and like they, he, he put them in situations where they didn't, couldn't have kids so that they would daven and, and then he would, uh, he would give, uh, he would, you know, and then he, he helped them. Now, obviously if you understand that on a simplistic level, then like it's problematic. I'm just trying to point out, though, that that there is a reality to each one of these. But again, the question is, does this answer Eov's question, and are they understanding it correctly? Yeah, yeah. Similar thing with the second one, also. Like, have you heard this concept before that, like, if, you know, you go through a certain amount of suffering in this world, and like, like, there's a concept of like, if uh, people say like, if you, uh, you know, why do Rishayim uh, uh, enjoy success in this world? Yeah, in other words, Hashem is like using up all their reward in this world so that they they uh, they don't get any reward in Olam Haba. And the people say the same thing for Tadikim, that like they're using up all of their, uh, they're getting all their punishment in this world so that they get. We did a mitzvah on that. Did we? Yeah. Like you said, like the Rashaim, like it's impossible that a Rasha does no good. So that are, and then a, that's why a Rasha Yeah, we definitely did say it. With Olam Haba? Yeah, you said that they get their punishment here. I mean, I mean, couldn't be for Mishlei because I, I don't know. Uh, I definitely didn't teach Olam Haba ideas in Mishlei. Might have been Haba, something else. But just that, like, why are like Russians like not happy? But like, why do they have like some good? Oh yeah. Because it's impossible that Russia doesn't do anything good. Maybe I don't know. Um, are you thinking about when we were talking about weighing, uh, uh, like God judging you on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur? No? no. Okay, I don't know. I remember doing it in the Beit Midrash. Yeah, I remember doing the Beit Midrash. Thank you. Right. <laughs> okay, so that does sound like Mishlei. Or Kohelis, maybe. Yeah. I think it's just because someone had a question of, like, why is Rasha getting good? Oh, it could be. All right, maybe. I don't, I'm, I'm not remembering anything. Okay, so that, that's possibility number three. And you see why this is extrinsic? 
Because the thing, it's not the thing itself that he's doing, and it's not, and the thing that's resulting from it is not. The yeah, in other words, it, the, the the reward is not coming from you experiencing pain. It's that the pain okay. makes you turn to God, and you dive into God, and then God gives you the the good thing. Okay. Number four is a nisayon, and that's what I think Eliana said yesterday, uh, that maybe EO suffering is a test, and if he passes, then he'll be rewarded. Okay, this we definitely know is in the Torah, right? Uh, most famously with? Abraham. Abraham. Yeah, okay, right? Right, but the reward is not coming from the process of the suffering. It's you demonstrating some other quality from the suffering, or you like like achieving some sort of a goal from the suffering, you know? Uh, it's not coming from the suffering itself. Um, whereas numbers one and two, like it's like intrinsically bound up with stuff. Like for example, with the testing, God could test you in many ways, you know, like, and uh, and then reward you in, in, in many ways. It's not like the particular thing leads to the reward. Uh, five is uh, uh, is preventative, okay? Uh, that EO suffering is designed to prevent him from sinning in the future. Thus, he'll get more reward than he would have if he had sinned. If that makes sense. Okay, there's an example of this two parshios ago in Breshis. Uh, of the people who lived a really long life, anyone know who? Yeah, he lived the longest life. Anyone know who lived a tremendously shorter life? Shot? I don't know, like in the Torah. Accidentally, wasn't there any, like one of the generations that got like his son-in-law was like going hunting. That's, that rings a bell. Yeah, I don't think that's the person I'm thinking of. Um, so it's a uh, Hanoch. Okay, so it says Hanoch. Actually, I'll show you the Pasuk just because it's good, good to, to know. Um, and uh, yeah, I actually want to show you the Pasuk and the Rashi. Uh, Rashi says this idea. What? It's not working? Oh, there we go. Whew. Yeah, did you not know about my whole, uh, did I not tell you about the whole Allah Torah thing? Mm -hmm. oh, oh my. Um, let me just pause this for one second here. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, a bunch of people shared it, I guess. Yeah, I guess, yeah. Um, okay, so what were we looking for? Oh yeah, um, Hanukh. Uh, so this is in Dalit. Uh, Ah, oh, yeah, no. Yeah, so the Puzzuk says, oh, it's in hay. Sorry, that's why I'm in the wrong pair. It's in hay. Yes, this one's going through the generations. Okay, here we go. So the, the pattern here, I don't know if you're going to do this. I, I, I forgot what's in Mrs. H. Vader's curriculum and what's not. Um, let me reset this here. Okay, so. Um, Pattern here is like this. Uh, uh, yeah. So Mahalal El lived for 65 years and he had Yared. Okay. And then it says, And he died. Okay. And it goes through, it says basically when, how long they lived. How you know that they had kids and then they died. But then when it gets to Hanoch, it says, Vaihi Yared, uh Vaihi Yared, Hanoch. All right, fine, blah blah blah. All right, Vaihi Hanoch, Hamish Vishishim Shana. He lived for uh for yeah, for 65 years. Viola as Musushalach, he had Musushalach Vis Halech Hanoch as Elokim. Hanoch walked with God. Achrei Holido as Mesushalach after he had Mesushalach Shalosh Meyo Shana for 300 years. Vayola Bani Mavanos. Vayhi Koyme Hanoch Hamish Vishishim Shana Ushlosh Meyo Shana. Vayis Halak Hanoch Es Halakim Veenenu. He Lakach also Halakim. Hanoch walked with God and was no more because God took him. So it doesn't say he died. It says God took him and it also he lived for only 365 years instead of like 7, 800, 900 years. So the question is why? So Rashi says on this, uh, Tzadik Haya, he was a Tzadik, V'kal Badato Lashuv Ul What does that mean? 
Yeah, it was easy for him to return to, to do bad. Lafikach miher hakadosh baruch hu. Therefore, God hastened; he was quick. The silko, and he took, he removed him. Vehemiso kodem zmano, and killed him prematurely. Ah, but well, it depends on how you find good, right? Because what what would have had you know the what happens in Brachis? What would have happened uh, if he lived longer? How? What was happening in the world? Oh, the mob, the all he would have gotten caught up in the mobble generation and gone bad with all of them and like died in the mobble. So God took him early. Okay, so that's like a paradigm for what Bildad might be suggesting here, which is that, um, which is that if maybe, oh, hold on. So, oh, actually, it works on your screen. All right, fine. My screen is in the presenter view, which is annoying. Um, so, in other words, maybe God. Uh, was making him suffer because let's say he would have kept his wealth, right? What might have happened? Yeah, maybe he would have like sinned with his wealth or his wealth would have made him haughty and he would have sinned or whatever, you know? So maybe God is not giving him reward, but like preventing him from doing a sin, which would have taken away from his reward. Okay, so these are the possibilities that Eve lays out for what Bildad could have meant. Okay, now we're going to go through each one and try to figure out what's, what's wrong with it and what Eve is going to say, okay? So... So Bildad's claim, your suffering will necessarily and organically yield a future reward like child worth. What would be, if you were Eov, how would you respond to this? Uh, well, you yeah, okay, good. It's like, you got to explain to me, Eov, what exactly is this cause and effect relationship? You can't just say, oh, like, like it, it, it works. Okay, for example, here's another example uh, that fits into this. Uh, when people are uh, trying to work out in a gym, and they and what what do they tell you if you're if you're feeling uh, like if you're feeling discouraged and it's too painful? Keep going. Yeah. What was it? What's the slogan? No pain, no, no gain. pain, no gain. Right now they say that. Okay, but what's the reasoning behind it? Why is working out painful? Your you're literally breaking down your muscles and like re, re, rebuilding them. So there, if you say no pain, no gain, there's an actual explanation for how the pain produces the gains, right? Um, but in this case, you know, or let's say, for example, you're a farmer and you're like harvesting your crops, right? And like, it's a lot of hard work. So there you can understand. Yeah, the only way to get the crops from their place in the field into your uh, your silo is like to go through the hard process, of like, like, like uh, you know, harvesting them and like bringing them in, you know? He was basically saying, you're just telling me that that this is gonna naturally result in a gain, but you're not telling me how, okay? So that's EO's main objection here. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, next. Uh, so he's saying your suffering is precisely meted out by Hashem and you will receive reward corresponding exactly to the suffering. So these are the pain, the painful carnival tickets, right? Mm -hmm. Is God is giving you, uh, let's say, for example, losing your sheep is worth like 500 carnival ticket pain, pain tickets. And, uh, and then your donkeys is 500 more and your kids is like thousands. And then once you get all these pain things, you can, you'll redeem them for reward. Okay. So what would you respond to that? Okay, so number one, same thing as it doesn't make sense. That just because you suffer, you just get on exactly. Okay, so number one, there's no evidence. Okay, but Eov is going to make a. Uh, so yeah, I, I I don't think he makes that argument explicitly, but it's like uh, that's a good argument. He. Oh, okay, good. There's another. Is it, it would not be just? Okay. Ah, uh, okay, good. Right? Who? Yeah. Okay, good. So he actually uh, he makes that argument for another one, but I think it applies to this one also. So he makes a, a kind of a, a a sneaky argument here. Okay. So he says, it, "You, Bilda, told me that the only way for me to get the reward is to stay strong and to not like buckle under the 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 pain." But if Bilda is correct, and the more pain you get, the more reward you get. What should Eov do? That he should no. suffer. He should suffer, okay, and uh, and uh, and then that that will get me more reward. So it should be like the more I suffer, then the more reward I'll get. And I don't know how many if you learned this in any of your history classes. Uh, what groups uh, do you learn about the Christians who would like whip themselves or like 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 starve themselves or like do all these like self affliction type things in order to get like reward in heaven? No? no, that's similar. Yeah, so it's a type of asceticism. You know, what, what, what do you, okay, asceticism, you know the word ascetic? Uh, not to be confused with aesthetic. Oh, I thought you said like 
Ascetic with uh, no, a, a S C E T I C. Uh, so ascetic. So it's either self deprivation, like a self depriving lifestyle or self affliction lifestyle. So, so basically what he's saying is like, if you hold that, that the pain and suffering is how God rewards me. So then I should go all in on it. And you shouldn't tell me to try to like withstand the pain or brace myself against the pain or like maintain happiness. I should feel the full brunt of the suffering in order to maximize my reward. Okay. Yes, that's also true. Yeah, that's also true. I guess though here, the first one, like in other words, let's say <laughs> there's no argument with the childbirth thing. If I make myself suffer more pain in childbirth, then I'll get a better baby. Like, you know, there's there's no like, you know, um, or even with the, with, the, with the working out thing, like it's not the pain, it's not like you can always just use the reasoning of add more pain and get more gain. Whereas here, if it's like a compensation system, where like I, the more pain I experience in Olam Hazed, then the more reward I'm gonna get in Olam Haba, then like there is an argument for saying like maximize the pain. Okay, so that's his argument there. Is this a true idea at all? Um, so I have an understanding of, this is my own theory that I'm gonna share. Okay, I, I have not verified this. Okay, so there's this idea that Hazal talk about where um, like the Avos were concerned that if they got good in this world, then they're like using up their reward in Olam Haba. Okay, so that sounds kind of like this idea. Okay, I have a different understand, understanding of it. Anyone wanna interpret like wh how that would make sense? Yeah, so I, I think what it means is that they're worried that if they get too much success and enjoyment in this world, it's going to throw them off the track and they're going to relate to it improperly or they're going to like stop, you know, learning or stop pursuing righteousness and then that's going to diminish their reward in Olam Haba. So I, I don't think that it's literally like a compensation thing where you got to like save up all your tickets for Olam Haba, you know? Okay. Yeah, that's my understanding, but I, I don't have a proof for that. That's just the, taking it literally just does not sit with my understanding of reward and punishment. Okay, theory number three, Tila. Your suffering is meant to compel you to pray, and Hashem will reward you by answering your prayers. So God is making you suffer in order to get you to daven so that you can like uh, uh, get more reward. So what would you say to this? Hashem doesn't need your prayers. Okay, good. Hashem doesn't need your your, your prayers. Okay. Didn't he already pray? Didn't he what? Didn't he already pray at some point? Uh, it doesn't didn't say that he prayed, right? He praised God, but he didn't like ask for stuff. Any other objections to this? And by the way, each of these things, there could be many objections to. Just because you didn't say it doesn't mean it's not good. Maybe he'll say, like, oh, I prayed you four times, so why am I getting suffering? Yeah. Okay, that, that's possible, but we don't see evidence that you have, like, prayed to Hashem from this. Which is also interesting, okay. right? No, beforehand, before you suffered. But, but that's not going to address yeah, Bill that thing, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, even if he does pray, he's going to, like, he wants his kids back. That's also true. Okay. Uh, I'll give you, a, a, yes, so this is where he brings up the justice argument. So he's saying, it is unjust to torment a tzaddik to make him plead for mercy, right? As though like he's a Russian, you know? <laughs> um, so, and if, so in other words, like, yeah, if, if I go to you and I say like, uh, like, <laughs> like, yeah, let's say I go to you and I like slash your tires of your car, okay? <laughs> and, and say like, and then you're like, why'd you do that? Cause I want you to ask me for a new car, you know, like, it's just like, it, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's not very just. And then, and then his argument is he's saying like, if God is willing to do that, then why should I trust him that he's going to like, listen to my pleas for mercy? Like we're already dealing with an unjust individual, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, just, it's not, not a, uh, you know, or let's say like, let's say I go up to someone and uh, maybe I give this an analogy later on. No, no. Yeah. Let's say I go up to someone and I like break their nose in five places and they're like, why'd you do that? So I can pay for your nose job, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. So it's like, like, even, I guess, even if it's a better phone, there's definitely an injustice in like, you know, doing that. And it, it feels more unjust when it's like a, I'm torturing you so that you could plead to me for mercy. Like, that's like a. I'm doing bad to you so you can. He's like God's trying to his power. Right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. You, but don't worry. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, feel it feels it feels like it stems from some sort of sadistic like uh yeah impulse or power hungry impulse. Yeah, okay. Number four is the Nisayan. Okay, um, your suffering is a test. If you pass, then you'll be rewarded. Okay. Now, uh, I, I can't go too much into the, what the true idea of Nisayan is because that is definitely going to be in Mrs. Fader's curriculum for uh, the Akeda. Okay. You know, um, but uh, any uh, any objections to uh, to this notion that God is testing him? Well, if he can handle the test, then why 
if you need it. Okay, good. If not, then Okay, good, good. I, I think, I think. Meaning God knows if he can handle it, right? So what's the purpose of this specific? Why bother testing, Why bother testing him in the first place? Yeah, yeah, okay, good. So um, so Eo gives a different argument, by the way. I mean, I think that's a good argument. He says, uh, if an individual dies as a result of the test, then then he's not going to get reward, okay? He's not dead. And he says it's yeah. as if he's dead. Okay, uh, he says, you've destroyed me beyond the point of like... Uh, he's just being dramatic. That's a bad argument. Yeah, I, I think that Ayala's argument is stronger, personally, okay? Um, but, uh, oops, sorry. Yeah, so the, he, he's saying that you... you um, you you've gone too far. Okay, you've gone too far in your test. Um, I, I think you can give an example of this in. Um, maybe this is a bad example. Also, um, let me just think if this is a good example here. Like, okay, this is gonna. I don't know if anyone's squeamish about animal testing, but <laughs> um, like you know how uh, how they so the, the the they do these things where like they'll uh, they want to. Uh, did you guys learn about conditioning? Yeah, in any, yes, yeah. Conditioning. yeah, right. So like you reward an animal for doing something and like it'll, it'll reinforce the behavior and like you punish it. Yeah, right, the Skinner box. Yeah, operant conditioning. Yeah, yeah, because when you're trying to make that, you're trying to shape their behavior, right? So I think there were certain like cases where like they went too far in punishing the animal. Like I think there was, I don't remember what they were trying to test for, but one where like, like they made the animal get like random shocks that didn't correspond to like stuff. And eventually the animal gets to this point where it just doesn't do anything because it's just too afraid of like the painful stimuli. So at that point, you've like, you've in your effort to test it, you've crippled the organism and it, it can't like thrive anymore. So I think that's the type of argument that you was making saying like, yeah, if you say like, you know, you uh, like, or here, here's a better example, you know, the marshmallow test yeah. with a kid. And like, if you wait for a minute, then, sorry, you can eat, eat the marshmallow now, or if you wait for a minute, then I'll give you two marshmallows, you know? So, like, let's say you push that to the extreme. You say, we're going to starve the kid for three days. And if we starve the kid, then we'll give him a lot of candy right afterwards. So there's a certain point where you destroy the kid's ability to enjoy candy, like their body starts shutting down or something, you know? That's kind of the argument that Eva's making, is you've gone too far in the test. And like, this is not gonna result in any, in it, this can't result in any reward because you, you've uh, you've destroyed me too much. Okay, number, uh, like it'd be uh, one more example here, right? Hashem wanted to test Abraham. We'll go, you guys will go into that later to see if he would be willing to sacrifice his uh, his, his son. Imagine if Avram actually went through it and the test actually like was to see if he would actually do it. It's possible to argue that if he destroyed his son, that would that would ruin Avram's life and he wouldn't be able to like like enjoy or or carry out the reward that Hashem gave him because it would be, just be too traumatic. I mean, it ruined Sarah even as a thought. Right, according to the Midrash, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So it's yeah. Kind of like what you were saying, like when Really yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That that is, and and you could say that like Elisheva said that he's being over dramatic, or you could say that no, like really losing all your kids and all your property is uh, is like too much, you know? Yeah. Uh, five is preventive. Is your suffering is designed to prevent you from sinning in the future, so you will receive more reward than you would have if you had sinned. Okay. Right. So Hashem's preventing him from sinning more. Forcing him to get a reward. Right. If someone wants to just live their life and sin, like that's on them. Yeah. So I think that that's a good argument. That's the argument I would make, which is that this kind of undermines the whole point of free will, yeah. right? Like the whole thing with free will is that you choose, you get a reward. If you do some, do the good, then you get a reward. And if you do the bad, then you get a punishment. So once God starts to interfere with people sinning in the future, like, so how far are you going to take that then? Like, you know, the, yeah, I, I, I'd say yeah, but I don't know the story. I've never learned the story in depth, so I don't, I don't know for sure. So um, so he, he, he puts it in justice terms again, is how is it just to punish someone, so to speak, before they sin, because they might sin in the future, okay? And here's, all, this is another, um, another example, kind of like the slashing of the tires, but if a <laughs> doctor removes a healthy kidney and says, I did this because I'm preventing you from getting kidney disease in the future, Okay, so like, you know, I, I don't know if that's like a good doctor, you know, like, like, espe especially if you might not, you know, get kidney disease in the future, like maybe yeah. like you should be able to choose and see whether you're gonna, uh, you know, live in a way that's healthy for your kidneys or not. Now, you can argue that God knows what you're going to do in the future. But again, that's why I think the free will argument is stronger, like, 
like it's, it's not right for God to intervene, intervene in free will uh, to bring from sinning in the future. And there's a refutation for this in this week's Parsha, um, famous Rashi that everyone quotes about Yishmael. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, the argument against Yishmael uh, living is like when, when Hagar like runs away and stuff is Yishmael is going to go on to do bad in the future. Uh, that might be a chazal that's relevant, but so let's say if you want to make the argument that Hashem shouldn't save Yishmael because he's going to, he's going to sin in the future. Now, right. So, anyone know the phrase I'm thinking of? Oh, well, low. He doesn't bring the punishment before the. That is another statement of Chazal. Yeah. yeah. This is. Uh, um, all right. Let me, let me get the actual quote here because I'm, I'm not remembering it either. Um, uh, this week, let's see. Will be the easiest way to do it. Um, Yeah, the episode of Hagar and Yishmael running away. Be'er um, um, Rashi. Maybe it's not this. <laughs> okay, maybe this not. The, the phrase Ba'asher Husham. That sounds familiar. Yeah, right? Is that Ba'ishmael? Or is that by someone else? I thought it was by Yishmael. I really don't. You know how much it shows history, so like you can look up any, you can look up phrases and find. Yeah, yeah, that's what that's what I just did. Oh, uh, yeah, I can just look for that phrase you're saying. Yeah, that's true. But uh, share Husham. Doesn't mean free, or does it mean search? Uh, yeah, this is this is it. Um. Oh, it's a phrase in the puzzle. What am I think? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Ayal, you quoted the right Rashi. That's what Rashi said. Oh, yeah. No, sorry. I, I quoted the right Rashi also. <laughs> okay. So the puzzle says, God listened to the um, to the voice of the youth, and that's Yishmael. Uh, and an angel called to Hagar from the heavens. The Yomer La, Malach Hagar, and, and said, This is a pun, right? Malach Hagar. Because uh, it's a malach. Mm-hmm. Al tiri, uh, uh-huh. do not be afraid. Ki shama elokim es kol hanar ba asher husham. Because God has heard the voice of the youth as he is there. And Rashi says, lefi masim shu achshav hu nidon. He is judged on the actions he did now. Below lefi masha asit lasos. He's not judging what he's going to do in the future. Okay. Um, so that's the uh, that 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 is the argument I think that uh, Eov is making here, some or similar to the argument he's saying, like. Don't tell me that I'm going to sin in the future, and that's why you're punishing me now. Judge me on the actions that I'm doing now, and I haven't sinned yet. You know, if I sin in the future, then you can punish me for that. But don't punish me now because I'm going to sin in the future. That's not just. Okay. So summary is: no matter which way I, this is you know, talking, no matter which way I interpret your vague theory that God is making you suffer in order to reward you, then it's either baseless or unjust, and therefore you you don't have any basis for saying your point. Okay. And as we pointed out from just our discussion, there are lots of arguments you can make against Bildad's uh, points here. Okay, he was just mentioning one for each. Okay, but that's his main argument is like, when you claim that God is making me suffer to reward me in the future, like you just don't have any good argument for how that makes sense or how it's just. Okay. Was it like on purpose in the book, you supposed to use that argument? Yes. Or are there people that like kind of low-key defend them and be like, oh, he, he was using the SS as proof. So there, it's a good question. So it depends on on how much credit you give to his friends. So like there are approaches to Sefer Eov where each of them is making like solid arguments and then and uh, and like through Eov refuting them, then you 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 like you get to see like the parameters of where are their arguments good and where are their arguments bad. The approach I'm taking here is just to like il- illustrate an example of how like people will say these arguments superficially without thinking them through. And they're easily shot down by like Eov's uh, types of refutations. So it depends on who you learn. Um, uh, one thing I just want to show you in, in the next couple of minutes, not having to do with Eov, this is just another, uh, actually, uh, uh, yeah, just another cool feature by the way on uh, Alatora. 
Okay, so this is another thing that, that the guy showed me. Um, hold on, uh, why is this not? Whatever. So if you click on any word, uh, do you guys know what a concordantia is? It is a similar, it is a, a, a reference book like a dictionary, but what it does is it shows you every place in Tanakh where the word occurs. So let's say I want to look at um, uh, the phrase. Yeah, you see a bar of it or, or yeah. A, a graph of it? Yeah. Yeah, I remember teaching. Oh, you did? Okay, fine. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. So cool. Yeah, yeah. So that that, that helps. It's not clicking. Yeah, oh, it was just really slow. Yeah. Uh, he showed you this thingy with the. Yeah. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah, and the dictionary. So cool. No, no. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it. Yeah, it, th this is if you're ever doing Tanakh and you need a dictionary, you could click on anywhere in the Tanakh and it'll give you a, a complete dictionary with hyperlinks to all the places where it uses these in yeah. different ways. And in the Concordantia also, then it'll show you every puzzle where it comes up. So like the word Shema comes up 1,165 places in Tanakh. If you wanted to, let's say you just wanted to look at Eshma, so you click there, it's it's six places in Tanakh, it's you know? Like yeah, yeah, it really is. Uh, and <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Every time it comes up. Every time it comes up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, like like for tomorrow's shear, I'm going to be giving uh, the uh, a shear that involves the word uh, yargiz, uh, and yeah, so yeah, 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 that's the one. Yeah. Um, so like, I wanted to look it up. So I'm going to use this feature when I'm doing shearing? my research. What was that? Uh, that's Gazaz. Yeah. Um, oops, I click on something. Wait, wait, whatever. Let's see. You get the you get the point. All right. So let's take a break now. Four minutes, and then we'll uh, we'll come back later. Stop.